Hey, so guys, my hope here is that this does not feel like a bait and switch. Um, that's not the intent. Um, but over the weekend, sort of looking at our days, I'm realizing that it does not make sense for us to leave a lot of things undone. Um, and we're in the position where that could be the case both in lecture and in lab. And I had to sort of prioritize one over the other. So um, making an executive decision, what I decided to do is I decided to prioritize lecture over lab. Um, lecture, we've talked about calculations, but we haven't yet talked about the actual things you'll be doing in lab. So we're at a place in lab where we can meet and gather and talk about the lab and then get you started. And Christmas break will not be a, a, a gap that will cause problems. This material, I don't think that's the case. Um, we started the conversation about solids and liquids and gases, and I think if we don't reconnect with this now, it is going to create an unfortunate separation over Christmas break. So what we're going to do, guys, is today's second period, we are going to dig into this material. Um, we're going to wrap up this day. Um, then at the end of class today, I'm going to hand back to everybody um, your graded bonding labs. Well, they're scored. Um, your sc not labs, sorry, your scored bonding tests. And then guys, I will need these back from you tomorrow. I understand that tomorrow is not an A day, but it is now the last day of the quarter. Um, if for some reason that doesn't work for you and you can't get it back to me tomorrow, I can easily take it from you Wednesday. It just means you're gonna have to come to school on a day that you wouldn't otherwise come. So really the hard deadline for this test rewrite, guys, is going to be Wednesday um, by, by two o'clock. Um, but I can take it from you tomorrow as well. Um, but that's how we're going to manage our time. So questions about that? You guys okay? You got this? You got your notes from last time? Guys, grab your notes from last time and let's get started. I understand right now you've got a thousand things jumping through your minds as you're trying to wrap up your other classes. Guys, this is relatively approachable material. I think this will go well, um, but this is what we're going to do second period today. Are you guys good? We okay? All right. So, guys, this then is where we're at. Last time in class, we watched this video about solids and liquids and gases. We have a conceptual understanding of what they look like. We understand the forces that are at play. We understand what's going on when they change between phases. But now, guys, what we've got to do is we've got to talk about this. So what we're going to do is we are now going to talk about the properties of liquids. So guys, we are going to hone in on liquids and we're going to talk about the things that you need to know about the way that liquids behave. So frankly, it's just going to be a list of characteristic properties. Um, most of these you will be familiar with. The one that we're going to do a deeper dive on is vapor pressure. But guys, let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, viscosity. Do you remember this from last year? What is viscosity? No, that's actually volatility. Do you remember, Soph? Keep going. Yeah, I know what you're saying, but that's not quite there. I like what you're doing with your hands, though. Can I ask you a question? Which is more viscous, water or oil? Okay, so what is viscosity? It's thickness. Actually, guys, technically the answer is resistance to flow. Um, so if you don't know that, um, viscosity is resistance to flow. There is actually a viscosity meter. It is the silliest thing on the planet. It's literally a meter long tube with a steel ball. And the way that you measure viscosity is you fill the tube with the liquid and you drop the ball in and you time how long it takes to hit the bottom and that's how you measure viscosity. The more viscous the liquid, the longer it takes to hit the bottom. So guys, the question then becomes, how does viscosity relate to intermolecular forces? Is it a direct or an inverse relationship? Higher intermolecular forces, higher viscosity. 
you may want to write that down. So guys, this is a direct relationship with, um, with uh, intramolecular forces. So now let me ask you a question. Oil, cooking oil. Guys, what do cooking oil molecules look like? They're very nonpolar. They're long, but they're nonpolar. So guys, if cooking oil is nonpolar, why is it so viscous? What intermolecular force is at work? Induced dipoles. Yeah, do you see that? The induced dipoles in these cooking oil molecules, even though it's very nonpolar, guys, the, inter, the intermolecular, the induced dipoles are so strong that it makes it very viscous. There's another thing going on too. Guys, um, uh, cooking oil molecules are so long, it's hard for them to get out of the way. Water molecules just scatter because they're so small. But these cooking oil molecules, it's like trying to move dump trucks out of the way. They're, they're just big fat molecules and they don't move well. You guys good on viscosity? Okay, so guys, moving along then, I'm realizing I need my, my writing utensils today, so let me get them. So guys, the other two that we need to talk about that we talked about last time uh, in general chemistry, so not last time, but last year, are adhesive and cohesive forces. Because adhesive forces, like adhesive, um, are forces that exist um, between different substances. They bind one substance to another. An example of that is the meniscus. That is contrasted with cohesive forces. Those are forces that exist within a substance. And those are examples of those are things like surface tension. So guys, directly or inversely related to intermolecular forces. Directly related. So the stronger the intermolecular forces, the stronger the adhesive and the cohesive forces. You guys good on that? You okay? Yeah? So guys, let me ask you a question then. So if you put water in a, gra in a, in a graduated cylinder, you get this, right? Yeah, the meniscus. The idea is that the adhesive forces between the water and the glass are strong and it draws the water up the sides. Well, guys, this is the question that I've got for you. If you put mercury in a graduated cylinder, the meniscus goes the other way. Why? Okay, so the cohesive forces are stronger, right? But why? Why, if, if glass is glass, and if this is a different liquid, why would it change? So, so it, well, it is sort of a, t so guys, think about all the forces that are at play. In here, we've got mercury atoms, right? And then over here, we've got glass, and we know that glass is polar. How do we know that glass is polar? because polar water molecules are highly attracted to it. So guys, why is it that the forces within the mercury would be stronger than the forces with the glass? What's changing as it, and again, these are the things we gotta start talking about, and this is where the AP test will take you out at the knees. These are the things that you've gotta be able to think through. So guys, relative to water, what's the difference? Say it again. Mercury is not as polar. So guys, when we've got water, we've got polar glass, we've got polar water, those are crazy attracted and we've got the, the attraction there. But guys, what about the polarity of, of mercury atoms? Not very polar at all. So the polar glass is not strongly attracted to these atoms and so there isn't a strong attraction there. But guys, what kind of forces exist within this liquid? It's not an intermolecular force. What is it? What happens inside of metals? Metallic bonding, right? The sea of electrons. These mercury atoms are floating around in a sea of electrons, and that attraction holds them together. Not strongly enough to be a solid, but that, in, that, that, that uh, metallic bonding um, is stronger, and therefore the, the, um, the meniscus goes the other way. You guys good on that? 
Okay. All right. So guys, this one we do need to spend a couple minutes and talk about. And this is what is called vapor pressure. I would strongly encourage you to write these things down because guys, this is new. So write down the definition and then we are going to draw some high tech pictures. So guys, the definition of vapor pressure is the pressure of a gas supported over a liquid. By the way, do you have your books? If you have them, grab them. We'll need them in just a second, but if you have them, grab them. Oh, there's Calvin and Hobbes all over in this book. Okay, so guys, the best way to understand vapor pressure is to draw yourself a picture. So draw yourself a beaker. Better yet. I'm going to draw myself two beakers. Oh, yeah, because I can do that. Double trouble. Now, guys, here's what you're going to do. Down here, put some water in your beaker and just draw some dots to represent water molecules. So this is water. Now, in the beaker that's over on the right, we're going to make this... Uh, We'll make this methanol. Like so. Obviously, that's not what liquids look like. Those molecules should be way tighter packed together. But for our purposes, that'll be fine. You guys ready? So it goes like this. Now what you need to do is put a lid on each of your beakers. Now guys, do this beneath water. Identify the intermolecular forces that are at play within the liquid. Just write them down down here. What are the intermolecular forces that are at play? Then please do the same thing for, for CH3OH, which is methanol or wood alcohol. Even have some. I should be a chemistry teacher. Okay, guys, let's talk. What did you say for water? What are the intermolecular forces that are at play in water? So, what is the predominant force? Hydrogen forces. Do we have dipole dipole? Technically, yes, but you don't have to mention it twice because hydrogen forces are an example of dipole-dipole. Are there any other forces at play? Induced dipoles. Technically, you do need to put it because it is a force that's at play. On the AP test, they will actually specifically say, list all of the forces in this substance. You don't need to mention dipole-dipole if there's hydrogen forces, because one is a form of the other, but you do have to mention induced dipoles in everything, yeah. to everything, yeah. So on the AP test, if it says list all the forces, you have to include it. If it says list the predominant force, then it would just be hydrogen forces. So yeah, please. Oh no, if there's hydrogen forces and you put dipole, dipole, that's wrong. Um, if there are hydrogen forces and you don't put dipole dipole, you're okay because hydrogen forces are like a hopped up version of dipole dipole. Yeah? Okay. So guys, what about over here? What kind of forces do we got? We have induced dipole. What else? Hydrogen forces. Yeah. 
Um, yes, they will, uh, and frankly, a lot of times I do as well, because that's when I learned it in my formative years. Oh yeah, yeah, no, you're totally fine. Actually, it's only been in the last three or four years that they've even been encouraging the term hydrogen forces. So no, hydro if you use hydrogen bonding, you will be just fine. Okay, so guys, this then becomes the question. Which one has stronger intermolecular forces? And the answer is water. Any thoughts on why? Guys, why would water molecules, because they both have hydrogen forces, right? Guys, why is water's hydrogen forces stronger? This is something we haven't talked about yet. Why are hydrogen forces in water stronger? Yeah. Okay, so it has to do with the CH3. And that's part of it in that here we've got the oxygen, but what is it about, so you're right, CH3 is very nonpolar, so it's not a point of polarity. Um, but guys, why is it, and here, let's draw it. So this looks like this. So there's actually a couple reasons why, and you know obviously what water looks like. There, guys, there's a couple reasons why CH3OH's forces are weaker. So talk about the CH3. What are you thinking here? You actually said it. Let's just talk about it. Good. So this is not a naked proton. So that guy's got two naked protons where this only has one. And that is part of it. That's half of it. Yeah, so yeah, so here we have two naked protons. Here we have one naked proton. So two naked protons increases the likelihood that we're going to have those strong hydrogen forces. What else, y'all? Actually, let me just tell you. The CH3 is so big that it keeps the molecules spread out more. There's literally more space inside of alcohol than there is inside of water because the CH3 group is such a big, bulky group that it keeps the molecules physically spread out more. And the greater the distance, the weaker the intermolecular force. Does that make sense? Okay. So guys, here's what I'd like you to do then. Um, finish the picture. So we understand that we've got water down here, but if we turn this into a video, what are these molecules doing? What does it look like inside of a liquid? What's our analogy? Mosh pit, right? Guys, it's full on chaos inside of here. And what happens if one of these molecules gets to the surface? It leaves. What do we call that process? evaporation and so now we've got some molecules that are up here in the gas phase but you'll notice because there is a lid they cannot leave and because they cannot leave what do they do well some of them run into the surface of the water and when they do they stick so we've got molecules going into the vapor phase we call that evaporation. We've got molecules returning to the liquid phase. What do we call that? Condensation. And guys, eventually these reach equilibrium. They are leaving as fast as they are returning, which means that the amount of vapor up here becomes constant. We call that vapor pressure. So guys, the vapor pressure is the pressure of the gas supported over the liquid. And so the vapor pressure of this is a measure of how much of the liquid water jumps into the vapor phase and then, and because it reaches equilibrium, this vapor pressure becomes consistent. Do you get the idea? So what will the vapor phase, what, sorry, what will the vapor pressure of CH3OH be relative to water? Will the vapor pressure be higher or lower? I'm hearing both. Matt, support, you said it first, support higher. Okay. 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 Okay, so let's turn our attention to this then. So these forces are weaker or stronger? Weaker. So is it easier or harder to leave? Easier to leave. So we're going to have more molecules jumping up into 
the vapor phase, what about their ability to get recaptured? Will that be easier or harder? Harder because the forces aren't as strong when they make contact. So we will have more molecules up in the vapor phase. So will the pressure be higher or lower? Pressure will be higher. So guys, what is the relationship between vapor pressure and intermolecular force, direct or inverse? Inverse. The stronger the intermolecular force, the lower the vapor pressure. But guys, understand that we attribute the vapor pressure to the liquid. So we say the vapor pressure of the water is whatever it is. It's not the vapor pressure of the, of the, uh, the gas, the vapor. It's the vapor pressure of the liquid water. So now guys, you ready for this? What if we shove this on a Bunsen burner? What happens to the vapor pressure? Oh, heavens. What just happened? There we go. So guys, as temperature changes, the vapor pressure goes up, right? Do you see that? The molecules are moving faster. There's more energy to break the intermolecular forces. More of the molecules will go into the gas phase. Fewer of them can return. Get the idea? Now, open your books to page 1058. Oh yeah. One thousand fifty-eight. Do you get it? Do you get it? What do you get? Guys, why does water boil at a hundred degrees Celsius? What is its vapor pressure at 100 degrees Celsius? What is its vapor pressure at 100 Celsius? 760, which happens to be standard pressure. Do you get it? So guys, the idea is that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius because it's at that point that the vapor pressure is the same as atmospheric pressure at sea level, and that's when it starts to boil. So guess what? You can use a cup of boiling water as a barometer. In Utah, water boils at about 96 degrees. What does that tell us the atmospheric pressure is in Utah? Is 96 on there? Oh, there it is. 657. Well, guys, let's grab a phone and see if we're close. By the way, what about this? What's the weather right now? Stormy. And guys, if the weather is stormy right now, will the barometer be higher or lower than average in Utah? Lower because storms come in on low pressure fronts. So guys, right now the pressure is 638. So at 638, we're going to boil where? Yeah, somewhere around 96, 95, somewhere we could figure it out by taking averages because I think it's linear. Um, but guys, do you get the idea with vapor pressure and also how temperature influences it? You guys good? Okay. Let's keep going. And you guys all got down the idea, right, that it is inversely related uh, intermolecular force and vapor pressure? Okay. Okay, so then guys, what we need to do is we need to relate this to volatility and boiling point. So volatility, this you already know, is the ability to evaporate. Boiling point, as you know now, is the point at which the vapor pressure of the liquid equals atmospheric pressure. So volatility is ability to evaporate. Boiling point is the ability for all of it to evaporate. Call that boiling. But guys, the thing that you need to know is, is this directly or inversely related to intermolecular force? Volatility and boiling point. 
So let's talk about volatility. A volatility is the ability to evaporate. If you've got strong intermolecular forces, does it evaporate well? No, so that is inverse. Then guys, boiling point, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point. So that would be direct. So guys, there you have it. Those are the things that you need to be able to talk about in terms of relating intermolecular force to the behavior specifically of liquids and then certainly uh, gases as well as we think about vapor pressure. Things there you need to talk about because we're about to make a major change in thinking. You guys good? Donnie, you guys good? Okay. You guys all right? Okay. So guys, for the remainder of the day today, what we're going to do is we are going to talk about what are called phase diagrams. Scratch this in, uh, use this as the heading in your notes. And then guys, in just a second, we are going to draw a phase diagram together. But what I'd like to do is I would like to introduce you to a phase diagram. Please don't draw this. But let's take a look at sort of a skeleton of a phase diagram. You will see these on the AP test. Typically, they're in multiple choice. Um, I have seen one free response question where they ask you to interpret a phase diagram. But guys, notice the information that we're given. We're given temperature. We're given pressure. Then we have these three boundaries that separate this into regions. We have a region down here. So guys, in this region, high or low temperature? Low temperature. High or low pressure? Let's talk. What about temperature in this gray region? Temperature is low. Pressure is high. So what phase do you suppose that is? Solid, liquid, or gas. If something is cold and smushed, it will be a solid. Then guys, let's look at the other extreme. Down here, temperatures are high, pressures are predominantly low. That will probably be a gas, and then your liquid region is somewhere in between. So guys, this then represents the temperature pressure conditions for any substance. And it looks different for every substance, but you can draw a phase diagram for any substance that will tell you what phase is this substance in given its temperature and pressure. Do you get the general idea? Okay, so what we're going to do then is we are going to sketch one of these into your notes. So guys, do this with me. Uh, make it big, and here we go. So we're going to go like so. Then, gang, this is temperature. This is pressure. So, guys, if this is temperature and this is pressure, talk to me about the conditions at the dot. Don't draw it. Just talk to me about it. What is, what are the conditions at that dot? Absolute zero and a perfect vacuum. Okay, let that sink in. Guys, this is absolute zero, zero temperature, and zero pressure, which means no matter, which means a perfect vacuum. Then moving up in temperature and up in pressure. So guys, the first thing we've got then is a slow, kind of a, well, that's a little too curving, um, but it's, it's sort of like that. So we've got a line, no, that's, a, that's fine. A line like so. And then guys, from that line, draw a line with a little steeper slope that is as straight as you can get it. And then a curved line that goes off like so. Then let's label some parts. This is what is called the critical point. This is what is called 
the triple point. So now guys, given what we just talked about, please label the region solid, liquid, and gas. Don't do it big. You're gonna need more space. So now guys, we need to be a little gentle with what we're just gonna do or it's really gonna make a mess. But guys, this then is the, uh, let me catch up with you. So hopefully you're comfortable with the idea that this is a solid, this is a liquid, and I guess I'll just put it here. This is a gas. So guys, now let's label the lines. So draw an arrow here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here. So now guys, let's label what these lines represent. What do we call it when a solid turns into a liquid? Solid turns into a liquid is melting. Liquid into solid, obviously freezing. Then guys, liquid to a gas, we call that boiling or vaporization. Gas to liquid, we call that condensing. Then do you remember the bottom ones? Sublimation is going solid to gas. And then guys, deposition is gas to uh, solid. Any questions about the bits and pieces and regions? Okay, so guys, this is what you've got to be able to do then with this. And rather than me tell you about it, we're gonna bring Susie into the conversation here in just a second. Guys, what you've got to be able to do is you have got to be able to think through changes relative to phase as temperature and pressure changes. You'll see questions on the test that says you have carbon dioxide at three atmospheres of pressure. What happens to it if you heat it up from zero to 800 degrees Celsius? Things like that. So guys, you have got to be able to interpret changes relative to this diagram. So the best way to put this in motion is obviously to do it via a video. But before we do, I'd like to talk with you about these two interesting points. These will also come up in the video, um, but we may as well talk about them right now as well so that you have some background. So guys, let's talk about the triple point and let's talk about the uh, critical point. So let's do triple point first. If, and please don't draw this, it's just gonna be a mess on your paper. But guys, let's take a cup of water. If you have a cup of water at its triple point, what does it look like? What phase do you have at the triple point? All three. So we'll put a lid on it and you've got ice cubes and you've got vapor and you've obviously got the liquid. What is it doing? Is it freezing? Is it melting? Is it boiling? Is it condensing? Is it sublimating or is it depositing? Yes, it is doing all of those simultaneously. So the solid is becoming a liquid, the liquid's becoming a solid, the liquid is becoming a gas, the gas is becoming a liquid, and the solid is becoming a gas, and the gas is becoming a solid. All three of those things are happening in equilibrium. So if you were to come back and look at this cup a week later, what do you see? The exact same thing. Guys, nothing is changing. Nothing is changing. So then the interesting question is, what temperature and pressure conditions cause water to reach this unique state? To be honest with you, I don't remember, so we're gonna let Susie tell you. 
but guys, that is the triple point. Now, what about this? What about the critical point? Well, guys, here's, I don't know how for you to represent this, but you might want to draw a dot, dot, dot right there. That line does not end. The line between a solid and a liquid has no end. But guys, the line between a liquid and a gas ends. There comes a temperature pressure combination above which you actually no longer think about melting, or I'm sorry, boiling or condensing. It turns out you create another phase of matter called a supercritical fluid. Notice we don't call it a supercritical liquid. It is a supercritical fluid that behaves like a liquid and a gas simultaneously. Now guys, understand, and I know we talked about this, this isn't science fiction. They use supercritical carbon dioxide to decaffeinate coffee beans. You up the temperature and you up the pressure on carbon dioxide and it becomes supercritical. You stick coffee beans in it and the caffeine dissolves into it. Then they just siphon off the supercritical carbon dioxide, take the pressure off, the stuff evaporates and the caffeine crystallizes. It's kind of cool. There's actually a thing on it in your book if you're interested in reading. So, you guys good on these? Let's take a look. Let's let Susie take a swing at this. Here we go. A phase, a phase diagram and temperature and pressure conditions under which a substance is a solid, a liquid, or a gas. The lines that separate the phases are called phase boundaries. Okay, so guys, what we're going to do is we're going to play this video through twice. The first time I'm just going to let it go, then the second time we're going to slow down and we're going to talk about all the things that you need to have really picked up on. Somebody I think drew a picture of Susie on their last test. Annika, I think it might have been you. Maybe. Did you draw a picture of a per I figured it was Susie. It looked like the profile of a girl. Maybe not. Might have been on a lab. We'll talk later. Here we go. A phase diagram indicates the temperature and pressure conditions under which a substance is a solid, a liquid, or a gas. The lines that separate the phases are called phase boundaries. At any point along a phase boundary, the phases exist in equilibrium with one another. For example, in the phase diagram of water at one atmosphere of pressure and 100 degrees Celsius, liquid water and water. By the way, guys, it's worth mentioning, this is the phase di Never mind, I promised I was just going to let it play. No, we should do this one. This is the phase diagram of water. How is it different from the one that you drew? Which goes back? Yeah, the boundary between the solid and the liquid has a negative slope for water. The one that you drew has a positive slope. Water is the only substance on Earth where that line has a negative slope. We'll talk later. Water vapor exists in equilibrium. This point is known as the normal boiling point of water. Likewise, the temperature at which solid and liquid water are Let me go back at the tough spot. Any point along a phase boundary, the phases exist in equilibrium with one another. For example, in the phase diagram of water at one atmosphere of pressure and 100 degrees Celsius, liquid water and water vapor exist in equilibrium. This point is known as the normal boiling point of water. Likewise, the temperature at which solid and liquid water are in equilibrium at one atmosphere of pressure is known as the normal melting point. The point at which all three phase boundaries come together is known as the triple point. The so guys, notice, so the temperature is slightly above zero Celsius, but you understand that's 32 Fahrenheit. So we're below this temperature right now. So the triple point of water is not that exotic in terms of temperature, but look at the pressure. This is not atmospheres. This is Tor, which is the same as millimeters of mercury. So what did we say we're at right now? Like 640, didn't we say? And this is 4.5.
Okay. I'm frankly not sure. I just know it's not very high. This is a very, very low pressure. I've never tried to convert it. No, it changes relative to pressure. That's why water doesn't boil at 100 here in Utah. I know, right? Ronnie, oh. Exactly. Ronnie, were you going to say something? Okay, here we go. ...corresponds to the temperature and pressure combination at which all three phases of a substance exist simultaneously in equilibrium. When a sample of solid water or ice at one atmosphere of pressure is heated, it will melt when the normal melting point, zero degrees Celsius, is reached. At this point, water crosses the solid liquid phase boundary. If the sample is heated further, the liquid water's temperature will increase until it reaches the normal boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius. It will then vaporize, crossing the liquid gas phase boundary. Once the liquid is all vaporized, the temperature of the water vapor will increase as more heat is added. If a sample of solid water is heated at a pressure below the triple point, it will sublime rather than melt as the temperature increases because the only phase boundary it will cross is that between the solid and vapor phases. We can also track the changes in a sample of water as we vary pressure. If the pressure is increased on a sample of water vapor at 110 degrees Celsius, it will condense as it crosses the gas liquid phase boundary. Note that a sample of solid water or ice at a temperature slightly below the normal melting point will cross the solid liquid phase boundary and melt as pressure is increased. This is one of water's unusual properties. Oh, poop. Sorry. We're okay. Ah! Who's in charge here? ...boundary and melt as pressure is increased. This is one of water's unusual properties. The critical temperature is the temperature above which a gas cannot be liquefied regardless of the amount of pressure applied. The critical pressure is the pressure necessary to liquefy a gas at the critical temperature. The critical point is defined by the critical temperature and the critical pressure. Note that there is no phase boundary beyond the critical point. A substance in this region is known as a supercritical fluid and has properties associated with both gases and liquids. All right, guys, here we go. So we've kind of done this. We talked about the idea that we've got temperature pressure relationships. We understand that we can move these things in either direction. If we're at one atmosphere, we can melt and then boil liquid water. But guys, as we move along further into this, these are the kind of things that you've got to be able to think about. So rather than let Susie drive the conversation, Let's just get rid of this stuff and let's talk. So guys, first of all, we have, let's say that this is one atmosphere and let's say that up here is like 100 degrees Celsius. So we understand that if we take something that is a solid and if we add energy to it, it will liquefy and then it'll boil, right? But guys, this is the tricky bit then about water. If we take a water, if we take um, water as a solid, which, you know, is, is ice, and if we increase the pressure on this, notice that this thing melts. And again, ice is the only substance on earth that does this. So let's talk about why. Guys, why would crushing this make it melt? It breaks down this structure. Guys, this is why the density of water is less, sorry, ice is less than water. When water freezes, these molecules are so small that when they get together to form their hydrogen forces, they also push on each other as well. And we end up with these huge voids inside the ice crystal. Guys, what's inside these voids? Nothing. And so actually the density of water goes down when it freezes. You understand that there's no other substance on earth that does this. 
if our oceans were made of anything but water, the icebergs would be on the bottom. And we would be dead. All the fish would die. Because guys, when water freezes in like our mountain lakes, the ice crystals float to the top and they form a sheet of ice. Because understand that if our lakes were made of anything but water, the ice crystals would form and drop to the bottom and the lake would freeze from the bottom to the top and the fish would die. Go ahead. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Yeah, it's crazy. There's actually, this is really cool, really cold. Um, at the very, very bottom of the ocean, the pressure is actually high enough that methane, natural gas, exists as a solid. And so, yeah, it's actually called methane ice. And they're looking right now at ways to harvest that as a source of natural gas for us to burn because there's huge deposits of methane ice on the bottom. So we have time to do this. You've heard of the Bermuda Triangle? Do you know about that? Do you know they finally figured out what was going on? So guys, if you don't know about the Bermuda Triangle, it's this place outside of the island of Bermuda and planes would fly into this area and just disappear. You'd never hear from them again. And ships would sail into this area and you would never hear from them again. They just disappeared off the radar and they couldn't figure out why. If they, if they finally figured it out. It's actually methane ice. What was happening is down on the bottom of the ocean in this area, there are these huge deposits of methane ice. And when there were these small little earthquakes, these little tremors, it would actually jostle the methane ice and it would vaporize. And what there's, check it out on YouTube, it's amazing. They, they have videos of this happening and it looks like the ocean is boiling. But what's actually happening is all these bubbles of methane ice, of meth, not ice, all these bubbles of methane are coming up from the bottom and it literally makes the, the ocean look like a hot tub. Well, what does that do to the density of the liquid in that area? Density goes way down and boats can no longer float and they sink to the bottom. Yeah, they actually, they did research on this at a university where they built a big swimming pool and down at the bottom they took some PVC pipe and they drilled holes in it and hooked it up to an air compressor and then they floated a model of a tanker ship on the water and then they turned on the compressor and all these bubbles came up and the boat sank to the bottom. So they're thinking that that's what's happening to the ships. But what about airplanes? Imagine flying an airplane into a cloud of Bunsen burner gas. It's game over. You don't fall, you explode because obviously the jet is, or the plane is making heat and it ignited this ball of methane and just everybody was done. So, yeah. So, sort of to your point, but yeah. Oh. So guys, let's come back together. So what about this? A face, A face dye. dye. So the amount of pressure applied. Right. So guys, we also talked about this. This idea of the critical point. Again, not really chemically important to us because it's not something we do in here, but you do need to understand the definition. It's the point at which you can't squeeze something hard enough to get it to turn into a liquid. And for water, it's 217 atmospheres and 374 Kelvin. That's pretty hot and pretty squished. But guys, this is not where this ends. You also need to have a grasp on things like this. There we go. So guys, let's talk. On the left, guys, you have actually the data filled in for the um, phase diagram for liquid water. 
You'll notice that we've got the triple point, not something you need to know, but low pressure, low temperature, and this is the diagram for water. You'll notice again, this is important to remember that this has a negative slope for that boundary. And again, it's the only substance on earth that does, except for those really rare, th anyway, there's a couple, we're gonna say the only. Um, but guys, what that means is when you compress ice, it melts, again, the idea, is that as you make this smaller, these molecules actually start to push on each other and the crystal actually breaks down. Um, that's what's going on. But then guys, notice on the right, we've got carbon dioxide. So let's talk. Given this information for carbon dioxide, guys, notice that right here is room pressure, if you will one atmosphere. Guys, right in here is room temperature. But the thing to keep track of is room pressure. So guys, notice that pressure, the pressure in the room right here um, is one atmosphere. So if we look at carbon dioxide, we understand now why it's a gas. That's about 20 Celsius in one atmosphere. But guys, if we cool this down, it freezes. But it freezes into dry ice. Why dry ice? Because we would have to increase the pressure on the carbon dioxide to around five atmospheres before this can exist as a liquid. So guys, anything below five atmospheres of pressure and carbon dioxide cannot be liquefied and therefore it only sublimates and that's why we call it dry ice because it can't liquefy at these pressures. You get the idea? Okay, so guys, questions about phase diagrams? Okay, then let's do this quickly. Please do not try to write this down. But guys, all of this is, and please do write this down. Um, you need to look in your books at sections 12.1 and 12.2 we are not going to directly cover this in class. This is no longer a huge deal on the test. But guys, I would encourage you to at least look at this. Please don't write this down. Just join the conversation. So guys, we're now going to talk briefly about the little bit that you need to know about solids. First of all, you need to know that there are two types of solids. There are what are called crystalline solids. Crystalline solids are the things that you understand to be crystals like ice and salt and sugar and things like that. Crystalline solids have well-defined arrangements, flat surfaces and angles, um, quartz, diamonds, sugar, salt, things like that. Guys, there's another type of solid called an amorphous solid. Amorphous solids do not have an orderly structure. Think things like rubber and glass. Guys, glass is an amorphous solid. As a matter of fact, if you look it up, there is actually significant scientific research that says that glass is a liquid a very, very, very viscous liquid. They actually have examples of panes of glass that were made during the Elizabethan era where they have actually puddled to the bottom. They're actually thicker at the bottom of the top indicating that they flow. And if it flows, it's a liquid. So guys, if you look this up, if you look this up, the current thinking right now is that glass is in fact a solid, but there is still some argument about this. There are still um, material scientists that believe that glass is a liquid. And it's not one of these weird, is the earth flat kind of conversations. There really is scientific evidence that shows that glass could be a liquid. A what? Yeah, I know, right? So go ahead. Hold on just one second, y'all. Hold on, go ahead. Hundreds of years. Yeah, so you get glass, panes of glass um, that were, you know, that were thrown or whatever created hundreds of years ago. And you actually find that they are, they are thicker 
at the bottom than the top, indicating that they are flowing over time very slowly. Yeah. Could be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I know that panes of glass are easier to study simply because they are flat and typically more uniform um, than, than a glass that was made. Because the way they make panes of glass is different than the way you blow glass to make like a cup. Um, and now we just pour them in molds. But the, the, the formation process is different. So they look at panes, but could be, could work there too. So please. Could have, yeah, right? I know, exactly. But we know the melting point of the glass. I mean, certainly there's the possibility that temperature could make it softer, but it'd have to be really hot to get it to melt, right? I mean, even more than St. George hot, so, yeah. No, I agree, yeah. And again, those are the variables that we can't control for, and therefore it makes the research interesting, right? Go ahead, Jen. There definitely could be that. Right now, most of the glass that you can buy is actually what is called float glass. Um, and the way that they make it is they have a huge bath of molten tin. And then what they do is they pour the molten glass across this big like swimming pool full of tin and it becomes perfectly flat. It, be, it seeks its own level on the tin. And then they have this really cool system of rollers that lifts it gently off the tin. But yeah, so most of the glass that we buy right now is what is called float glass and that's how they make it. Yeah, so there you're absolutely, I mean, back in that day, they probably weren't making float glass. So maybe the imperfections were in the manufacturing. Yeah, it could definitely be. You guys good? Okay, so guys, do this with me. Um, last thing we need to talk about today. Under the subset of crystalline solids, this may be worth writing down. There are four types of crystalline solids. They are molecular solids, covalent network solids, ionic solids, and metallic solids. These are terms you need to know. So guys, the easiest way to explain this to you is to show you examples. And we're going to do them in sort of a random order. So let's pick the easy fruit first. When you think of ionic solids, you're obviously thinking of salts, at which, at which point, point you're thinking about lattice energies. When you're, when you're thinking about metallic solids, solids you are you're thinking about, about the sea of electrons. electrons. When you, when are, you are thinking, thinking about, about molecular, molecular solids, solids, you are you thinking are about, about things like, things like sugar, sugar that are held together, together with the and EMFs. Those three you're all familiar with. with. What, what do they all have in common? They're crystalline, crystalline, which means they have repeated structures. structures. But guys, the one that you're not familiar with are what are called covalent network solids. The most familiar example of this to you will be diamond. Because this is actually what it looks like inside a diamond. Let's contrast. Which one is this? This is ice. Which one is it? This is a molecular uh, crystal. You've got molecules held together with IMFs. Guys, this is table salt. Ionic. This is a covalent network solid. Notice, guys, that with this thing is held together with stupid, strong covalent bonds. But those covalent bonds don't just exist inside the molecules, which are then held together with IMFs. They exist through the entire stinking substance. 
That's what makes diamond so ridiculously strong, is this is a covalent network solid where every carbon is attached to every other carbon with a full covalent bond, and that's what makes these things wacky strong. So guys, please hear this. On the test, if you are introduced to substances that have stupid high melting points, they will be covalent network solids because that's the only thing that can explain something that melts at such ridiculously high temperatures, like diamond. Guys, sugar obviously melts at a low temperature. Ice melts at a low temperature because that's held together with IMS. Salts, higher. Those are, those are ionic forces. Covalent network solids, forget it. You guys good? Okay. So guys, we are now done for the day. Don't